<clears throat> Pardon me. I'm late for my afternoon tea. And now what I'm doing my other job. My real job, they say. More like an occupation. For it does occupy all your time and space. So that you can't do things like this. But I do this for you, America. And for you, Earth, whatever you are. In any case, the tour must go on. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the historic American Building Survey. California. Heart set. Today, we are going where we've never gone before. Well, actually, we're just going right up the street. This here, let's see what do we got. I might as well get my lengthy uh, tangent out of the way. Rushing up from the surface, my no doubt all important message, and being very facetious. I can only view the world from my point of view, so don't get mad when it's not your point of view, please. It seems in my somewhat scattered brain, America has some recurring themes running through it that you find when you go from small town to small town to small town to big city to coastal town to mountain town to river village. There are a great many of things that appear to be very similar to each other. I don't mean things like trains or women, <laughs> I guess, while well, there's one on the screen. Or even laughter. Or even men. Complete destitution and uh, destruction of all things. Although a great many cities do actually have this feature. This, if you couldn't read the uh, label, is in Maine. How weird is that, right? Maine had the same thing. It's like the pain in Maine is spread all over the same from California down to Sacramento again. Anyway, it seems to me, to my Brian, that there are a great many similarities in, in many cities, almost all cities. How was the town founded? Who is prominently featured in it? Early politicians, who are the early landowners. So really, you can tell by what are the streets named after. If it's not presidents, one, two, three, four, five streets, Central Street, there's a Grand Street, there'll be an, maybe sometimes certain cities, especially in California, like A, B, C, D. There'll be outskirts where they'll have usually the names of farm or landowners in the area. So finding out who these streets are named after is often the first step to take if you're trying to figure out who are the movers and shakers of the town. Oftentimes, the stories of the original, uh, say, ancestors of these current movers and shakers their stories are almost implausible great there are great men that do great things sure i also understand there are limitations there are a great number of men who seem to have infinite pockets and infinite ideas and infinite skill sets and they just dispersed across america and settled in and uh did amazing feats or brought with them enough knowledge and technology or whatever to complete to the to form a town now, I have never formed a town, okay? I'm going to tell you the truth. I've never started a civilization or a colony. I've never founded a colony. So I, I am just speculating. Now, I don't want any of you out there who have, you know, to get upset with me and say, nuh-uh, but you are more than welcome to say so because I admit my ignorance is, is vast. It's a deep, deep, dark pool, okay? My ignorance, let's just acknowledge it. That being said, I still find it unlikely that you have two or three men in every town. They just rolled in and got the ball rolling, no problem had the right connections, knew how to get the train there, knew how to, knew where the mines were, you know, whatever may be in the area, whatever bolstered the town. And then, of course, there's like a, a boom years, and then there's a mm, desertion almost, and it become ghost towns, or, you know, a few thousand people sort of hang on and stay there forever and just keep kicking the history down the road, which never really matches a timeline of greatness. Like, there's never really, the timelines don't seem to make sense. You find this all over in many cities, making me feel as if this was a very organized takedown of the human race by a parasitic force it's almost as if they trained in advance the art and they spent years and years working on this and when it was time they rolled out and often they feel like they marked their cities in the town square and i will show a video soon uh, that i have all across the world it's going to be a real a real mind blower so in national city for example bringing us to today national city is a little place i mean it's actually well it's got fifty thousand people and it. it's most famous for the critically claimed it turn of the killer tomatoes being filmed there which i'm sure all of you've seen at least five or a hundred times i mean i quote from it at least once uh mm, never which matches the amount of times i've seen it but it's in between san diego and uh it's about 15 minutes away from tijuana from with, from the border i think it's just east of san diego now i have come to the conclusion that i believe that these people rolled in and do areas that were already existed and abandoned and thusly they uncovered where the riches were where the train was you know all these other things it was already there they just had to nose it out and then of course you're the first one there so you get the best house you name the best street after yourself you become mayor first representative you know whatever it is and this just seems to be the theme because I, I can't explain it otherwise my brian can't really explain it otherwise 
So National City has got their own founder for here. Ah, uh, yes, there we go. Now, National City's man, his name is Frank Kimball. Mr. Frank Kimball had two brothers, and they built his house, and it featured hot water piped in to his bathtub, which was the first of its kind in the area to have that. And thusly, the town began to flourish, stemming from that, from that hot bathtub. From what hot bathtub do Belrock can tell? But the Kimballs weren't done there. Oh, no, no, no. They bought up most of the land. They founded, and I'm assuming constructed, the wharf, so meaning like, you know, the port. They also founded and ran a lumber mill. They also ran a brick manufactory. They also involved in architecture. And one of the things they did was they sold the deed to this land to the Holy Roman Catholic Church, where this puppy was constructed. Now, local legends have the architect as being one guy, Henry E. Cooper, but there's a book here. Through this page 41, the author talks of a Mr. Crocker that actually designed the building. Not Judge Crocker from last from Sacramento, different Crocker. Maybe extension of the Crocker family. Hell, I don't know. But this old Gothic church here is in pretty good condition still. Some things are slightly different. Mr. Kimball also developed a working relationship with the Mr. Irving Gill. You may remember him from the last video. Yes, somehow, this robot is pissing me off. The fuck you looking at, you John Lennon looking robot muff? Right now, buildings are bigger than Jesus. It's true. Goodbye now. Yellow submarine and all that. Oh, wait. Forgot. Park this way. <laughs> it's actually kind of more of a Ringo voice. You get the point. Well, that was no point. Except uh, I do want to point out. Um, no, I guess that would be a point. That would be a point then. Oh, for fuck's sakes. What have I done? Now, Mr. Gill, who had befriended Mr. Kimball, went on to design many of the structures in this area, including this one here. The studio type building. There was at one point an auditorium. 200 people and it's Mr. Granger was the alleged designer and Mr. Gill was the architect. Back here behind us is a 1060 pipe organ we're told which eventually was destroyed by vandals after they abandoned this building and supposedly the walls are 10 inches thick and uh, the whole thing is a remarkable acoustic qualities to it as well as interesting painted ceiling considered to have some of those lavish furnishings in all the land. Outside not looking like too much but in here, and this is a row, a group of row houses designed by Kimball. Now, each house is actually owned by someone different, but they are under some contractual obligation to maintain the facade and keep uh, sort of the historical continuity. But this is what our Mr. Kimball is, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Irving Gill. These are some of the buildings that he's uh, been doing here around, around young National City, making a name for himself. Check it out. <laughs> nice uh, jugs there, buddy. <laughs> I'm way more interested in this fire plants. You perverts. God, uh, every time it's breast with you. I don't know, Gavin Harley has a lot of beautiful things. I'll have to fix this in post so you don't sound like such a perv. All right, but now, I don't know who the hell left all these hair, but if y'all need to, you get down here and turn you up some butter. It ain't gonna turn itself now. This is Mr. Kimball's house back there in the shrubbery. Uh, that's presumably Mr. Kimball himself if you want to spit on him. Funny thing about this Kimball is one of the ways you know that this fool is an elite is here it says the post office was first located in one of the corner rooms of this house in 1870. Not only was the post office in one of the rooms of this house, this is where Kimball lived. There was a library, allegedly. They, you know what we always say about the people that founded the first libraries and all that. They seem to be tied into the... Can I help you, young man? Oh, no, sir. Uh, sorry. I, I was just mis just leaving. I was uh, I misplaced my uh, my bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> I've driven past this monster a few times. It's actually quite pretty. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's build a birdcage up on top of there in case somebody wants to get up there sometime and uh, be tortured and uh, we'll leave him out there to die or whatever. Or I don't know. Like, you guys did the freaking... What's his name? But this is the mission built... Well, I can't remember. Store on this one. This is the Mission San Luis Rey del Francia, founded in 1738. They completed it. They found it. You see, they, they, they tell you right here, they found it. <laughs> they founded the church in 18, uh, 1738, but it was completed in 1815. So what, what does that mean? What does founded mean? If not completed. Looking a little stripped down, looking a little modernized. You got your typical like, columns and the little door within a door. That's looking like something they took off the roof and just flipped upside down. <laughs> Mounted on the wall. Now, if this were Turkey and you found this, you'd be like, that's a third century aqueduct. But since it's California, it's just uh, 100 years old versus, you know, 10,000. Same here. This would be ancient ass ruins, were it not for the impatience and haste of my colleagues. Octagonal fountain seemingly in the middle of nowhere. What, what what you reckon happened over here? What I reckoned is something haunts up this man. Well, now that just don't look quite look like just a rock, now do it? No, sir, it does not. 
I'd venture to say it was part of a wall once. But what could have eroded a wall to such a point? Weather? Maybe after time. Much time. Or maybe water. Now then, what we have here is the Casa del Rancho Santa Margarita y las Flores in Oceanside, California, bra. I know Oceanside very well. I don't know this muff. Now, this is actually owned now by the president of the Citizens National Trust Bank. I suppose I, don't, I, suppose I don't know about now, but I, at the time of this writing, which was 1937. But the courtyard and the shape of these walls and the wonky uh, this and the this, you know, those things all sort of lead to uh, a different sort of history. This here be the Don Juan Bandini House, or also known as Ramona's Marriage Place. But why, you want to know? Directed in 1827 by Juan Bandini, two-story building with the first-story wall of adobe brick plaster and very modified, not very original, but it is the location. There's a movie or something filmed there, which is why it's called The Marriage Place. This is a funny area in here because you've got all these strange ruins and it's almost like the this little area's got you know, multiple layers of ruin. So this is allegedly erected and erected, res erected in 1816. It's owned by the Roman Catholic Church. The bell tower is made of stone and brick. And there's not really much known about it other than it's considered to be old mission churches. And this one is actually made out of lumpy potatoes. The rough hewn timber. This this seems normal. This seems like I believe the narrative, okay? There, I said it. I frickin' believe the narrative. If I could see it, I could believe it. If I can say it, I can survey it. Just like my hero, R. Kelly. <laughs> Just kidding. I actually don't particularly like rapists and things like that, you know, there's was, uh, was a video of him, god, the most embarrassing cringe video, he's somewhere overseas and he's just singing like that, as the band grooving along, gently, he just starts singing repeatedly, <laughs> I don't even remember the lyrics, some tune he's making, but he's something effective, if you and a friend want to get on my plane to America, if you got a valid passport, we can get it on, if you and a friend, <laughs> something, something like that, he just keeps repeating it over and over and over until the crowd gets it. Oh, he's speaking to us. It was embarrassing. No standards, just anybody out there got a passport? Let's get to getting it on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only criteria. Now, there was a time when America used to have this manufacturing that was superb. And they made things like this gas pump. And those amazing trains. And even like even the kitchen appliances, like the mixers or the sewing machines or typewriters. They, they last forever. And that, that day is gone. Now you got a blender. And that fucker might last a year if you're lucky. But I like this old stuff. This old, this, this is such a cool look. That was really the heyday of America. Until that little bitch, Woodrow Wilson, I say, that we're going to be progressive or what? We're gonna sign this deal here. We're gonna just usher in a new era. These my new friends over here tell me so. Isn't that right, my friends? And there's like a bunch of demons in the corner, like, yes, <laughs> yes, that is so. Make it so, Woodrow. They will speak of your name a hundred years from now. Yeah, we will. We were like, fuck you, Woodrow. It's because of you. We don't even name anyone Woodrow anymore. I mean, that might not be the case, but I'm gonna tell him that if I see him. In hell. If it's even a place you can go, I mean, it might even be here. Might even be, might even be right here. Might even be in there. In the summer, it's actually in there. Trust me, you don't want to be here in the summer. You might find Woodrow Wilson. This is the uh, Point Loma Lighthouse. Yes, sir. Point Loma. That's right. Interesting things as I poured through the data on this bad boy, which there is a lot. For some reason, this was of utmost importance. This lighthouse, which there is something very old world and very... There's a link between the domes of, say, Santorini in Greece and these lighthouses. There's a link between these and the carriages that I'm often pointing out on the tops of these other structures. And I'm thinking that there's a possibility that in those other housings, uh, rather than a bell, what they had was something akin to a light. And the bell, possibly, was just a cover, you know, to sort of the way that those old school little candle dampers. They say at night, the tower gains consciousness, is filled with rage. <laughs> That's just what they say. Oh, George, you forgot your hat. Oh, thank you, Winifred. Now we're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> but little did George know, he's about to be in direct violation of Penal Code R22R. And that's supposed to say no hats, but... Uh... God, get off my butt! So there was much data, much, many pictures, and a, and a uh, pretty uh, lengthy history to this particular lighthouse. And I will spare you the boring details. But a couple things that I thought were... Um, worth mentioning that this was discovered allegedly when the famous explorer Juan Cab Gabriel 
found it, landed on these islands at some point, or discovered Point Loma and landed San Diego some point in 1542. Allegedly the first time that Europeans had been there, although it's not true. So by 1854, they were putting this lighthouse in. And uh, the lens they were using was something called a pre presnal lens. And there's a funny bit here where Mr. Allison, Alan Stevenson just starts waxing poetically about this uh, this lens. And it's just hilarious <laughs> to me. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a testament to how dry this stuff is, that this is actually comic relief. Where he's just going nuts about it, saying, Nothing can be more beautiful than an entire apparatus for a fixed light of the first order. I know of no work of art more beautiful, more creditable to the boldness, the ardor, the intelligence, and the zeal of the lens artist, end quote. And now, Mrs. Stevenson, you may kiss the lens bride. So the interesting parts about this are that there's a report when, when several uh, high flutin officials showed up, people like major topographical engineers, the captain of triangular something, I can't remember, lofty title. They showed up and they gave their, they wrote the report about conditions of it before it opened, and they claimed that Parts of the tower that have been exposed to the weather are entirely gone. Entirely gone while it's under construction. The deficient bricks in the tower need to be removed and replaced by good ones, as well as the brick eaves. And the stonework of the dwelling needs to be redone. The cistern in the cellar is not holding water. The brick and mortar are in poor condition. The brick at some point even being worn to being within a quarter of an inch or uh, thin. Basically, a brick being eroded to the point where it's only about, it only has about a half an inch of thickness in some parts. Now that does not sound like three or four years of weather especially if they're just going to put new bricks in it. So it almost tells you right there that this is being constructed on top of something else. There's also a very interesting glitch. There's a newspaper, the San Diego Herald, which says that, the direct quote is, We learn from Mr. Smith, the gentleman employed in placing the lantern on Point Loma Lighthouse, that the work is nearly completed so that on a Monday or Tuesday next, the light will be lighted for the purpose of testing the machinery. We understand that orders have been received by Captain James Keating, keeper of the lighthouse on... Point Loma to light up on the 15th of November, but this, the newspaper is dated November 17th. So it's talking about two days after it already happened, which must have been, they must have seen it the lighting up, but they're, I guess, so it's just kind of interesting. And it, and according to the official reports, yeah, it took place at sunset. So they, they, it was reported as it actually did occur, the lighting on November 15th, yet this newspaper in the 17th talks about something that's coming up on the 15th. <laughs> so I don't know if it, it's, it's just, uh, maybe they made a mistake in their rewriting of the history of this stuff. I don't I don't know. Hey, you don't even know. One last point on this. There was a, a request for some documents to determine who was the original Keepers of the Light. J.S. Conway, the acting commissioner, responds in kind. It is regretted that a recent fire in the Department of Commerce building destroyed many valuable records relating to the construction of lighthouses on the Pacific coast, and such as were saved are not in condition for easy examination. It is therefore impractical impracticable to verify your list of the keepers. So imagine that, a fire in the Department of Commerce building, which just happened to destroy all the valuable records related to the construction of all the lighthouses. Wow. And the plot thickens. Uh, dun, dun, dun. In a world full of bullshit propaganda, one country rises above the rest from the people that brought you the Gold Rush, the Great Fire, the War of 1812, the Hundred Years' War. Now, in first time in THX Certified Audio, witness the experiment known as the United States of America. Rated R. This summer, come get united. <laughs> My new dentist finna take a new adventure. Motherfucker, did you get the thing that I sent you? Sorry, I thought we were still rapping, son. Cause if you think you think outside the box, you're trapped in one. MCPB. Where are we now? Besides, distracted. Oh, a cozy home. Well, I wonder what mystery lurks within. This very pleasant seeming California home. This is the... The Samuel Freeman house. Yes, sir. You would think that if we were to roll around regular uh, modern day construction and be like, well, who built that home? We'd be like, I don't know, Hudson Homes or something? It's a major corporation. Uh, who knows? So it's, I find it odd that all these homes were built by just one dude. For example, this house here you're looking at, built in 1924, was a flank. Lloyd Wright construction. Oh yes. How about that? Get old Frank Lloyd plugging away for the old deep state. Here we have the Bank of Commerce building. We saw this one once before. Flash, flash, flash past it flashing on them. Obviously the downstairs has been converted into, well, modern day ugliness and storefronts. And the top still retains a lot of its decoration. Of course the bank owns this, or owned it, and it's still called the exchange rate 
bank building, even though they were only here for five years. They only occupied this space for five years, but still we're going to call it that. The interior has been vastly remodeled, so they didn't even bother uh, photographing it. Just the outside. This drawing here is what it used to look like, which actually is rather breathtaking. And I also would like to point out the phoenixes on the top and the fact that these columns seem to have little wigs on them. Little wigs, like little Prince Valiant wigs. This is one of the better buildings in San Diego, as far as historical representation. Not much in the way of interest here in this house. I mean, it's a nice home, but yeah, no, nothing that we're looking for. We ain't looking for just a nice house, okay? No, sir. We're looking for clues, okay? On how to get the fuck out of this place. This realm we're trapped in. That's kind of weird. And that's where Gandalf wants to live. Now here we have two cottages. These walls seem a little low to me, if you ask me. Otherwise you wouldn't have to add the steel part. But these cottages are are owned by two women that they know very little about. Surprise, surprise. But they do know their names. And their names, well, at least one of them's name, is Mrs. Teets. Miss Catherine Teets. T-E-A-T-S. I did not know that was the last name, and I don't think it is is but whatever miss cat teats no one knows about she lived alone across the street there was another woman and her name was i don't remember miss something normal these are called the albatross cottages i guess the only important part that is related to what we care about is that these were built also by irving gill irving gill is the same guy that, from earlier these cottages are not very remarkable I, I don't think. The architect, however, would disagree with me. And he goes on record in some magazine and writes this op-ed about these albatross cottages. And to me, it has the distinct impression of someone really hyping something up that is not worthy. Like someone really hyping up. I guess the, the best example I can come up with it. I was once at a, a gathering of some friends. And there was a man there who I didn't know. And this guy was, well, he was experimenting with uh, psychotropics of some sort. To be forthright, I believe he had imbibed some of the mushrooms of the psychedelic type. And this man was... Just bugging out about the sun chips he was eating. He's trying to steer the whole conversation towards these feelings he was having about chips. And it was really kind of comical, but uh, a little bit annoying. So he kept saying things like, dude, but I mean, seriously, like, chips, dude. I mean, I never even thought about it. Just think about it, dude. Just, like, what are they? Like, chips. Chips are a trip, dude. Man, fucking chips, dude. I love chips. Dude, have you ever even... Have you guys ever thought... Wait, wait, hold on. Have you guys ever thought about chips? You know, it went on and on and on like that. I'm glad you're having fun with the chips. I guess the point of all that is that this gentleman, Mr. Gill, who I immediately formed a dislike of when I read these words, it's like he built these buildings. He has no clue how to do the ornamentation of the old world buildings, right? Because it was already there. So whether or not these were there, I don't know. I think it's funny that this this is a window into what do these architects do when all the buildings have been discovered or dug up or they've given credit for them and then now they're called to commission to do these other these other more modern properties. What do they do? You know, how do they fake the funk? Well, it looks like this guy, you know, just builds regular white cube houses and then suddenly decides that he is not an architect but he's an anti-dust warrior and he's just he's out to get dust and so he, he it's just an amazing so i'll read a second of it just so you can get the idea of what i'm talking about cool it's the craftsman magazine it's may, may 1916 we should build our homes simple plain and substantial as a boulder then leave the ornamentation of it to nature i believe also that houses should be absolutely sanitary in the recent houses i built the wall joins the flooring is slightly rounded so that it forms one continuous piece with no place for the dust to enter or to lodge no crack for vermin of any kind to exist there's no molding for pictures no plates or chairs no baseboards no paneling to catch and hold the dust which the walls and all cornices rounded not a particle of grease or dirt can lodge not a particle of dampness can collect and become unwholesome there's no chance anywhere in the house for dust to accumulate there's something very restful and satisfying in my mind in this simple cube house with creamy walls sheer and plain rising boldly into the sky unrelieved by cornice or overhang of roof unornamented save for the vines that soften the line or creepers that read a pillar i like the bare honesty of these homes the childlike frankness and chaste simplicity of them and that is how you explain away why you can no longer make houses beautiful you just basically blow blow smoke up the cube's ass i rest my case next we have the extremely ornamented and quite incredible al ballpark the california tower one of the most outstanding examples of spanish baroque reproduction in north america the tower was designed to express the spanish heritage by bertram grosvenor goodhue of new york and carl winslow the project architect this was built for the 1915 exposition the world fair 
The chimes that are installed can be heard for 25 miles. Randomly, the tower was used as a hospital training unit by the Navy through the war, which seems like a very strange way to do. And now, inside this building here, the California building, there is the Museum of Man, which is the worst named museum maybe of all time. And I've been around these, and I just can't believe how outlandishly old world they look. And I just can't believe I never noticed until the spell was broken for me. But we didn't build this, guys. We didn't make King Philip or Cad Padrio. Or, uh, I can't get behind it. This is here. This here is the button. Botanical Garden, looking very much like the Crystal Palace of yesteryear. And it's still there that I'm aware of. A lot of the decor has been sort of stripped off of it. I don't think that these chalices are here anymore. This is obviously still missing its crystal housing or whatever. But, um, yeah, very out of place. I mean, pretty obvious that this is from some literally different timeline. Here's the interior view over there. Looking rather bird cage -ish. This here building. You know, California has- They do a really shit job of organizing their particular survey. There's had to have come much later in the game, so I don't understand what their problem is. They name all of their files like this like the name of the year so they're impossible to search for even in their own catalog and i feel like it's intentional like they intentionally obfuscate things i mean there's not a single building that just has a regular unknown story just like yeah it's a barn built here they all have some stupid backstory that's very specific and uh, uh you know too specific this one for example let's see if i can remember it anyway you yeah, know she got these little thingies here little thing at the top there i'm trying to mention that this was a uh, Owned by the Odd Fellows, of course, the IOOF. They own the whole block, and they struck some agreement with the Masons, and they met here and had their rites, the rituals, and they laid the cornerstone. And it was all very strange, dealing with the fact that they constructed this building with the help of the Masons in Unity. I had to sift through twenty pages just to find that data, and once I read it, I was like, "I'm not going back, bro." And of course, we have a Bank of America here. Why wouldn't it be a Bank of America? Built in 1880, occupied by Clobber and Levi, 1870. So yeah, that makes sense. Built in 1880, but occupied in 1878. You see what I'm talking about? They do these date stuff all the time I'm wrong all, all the time over here. The principal tenant, of course, is now Grand Floor Bank of America. This was in 1936. Also curious here. Yeah. And at this moment, I'm growing weary of a lot of the mundane properties in this next leg, so I whipped up an impromptu song about our current leader and what we're doing now. I don't know why I did this, but I did, so enjoy. Well, I, I feel great No thanks to this state Where can I find Some friends that have an open mind It would be such a thrill Yeah, if you, me, could take the red pill And go along with me On an adventure
I certainly gave Pennsylvania a very hard time for all their abandonment. That was nearly my toe, Jimmy! What I was saying before I was so rudely nearly amputated of toe is that to my surprise, California has its fair share of distraught, destroyed, no-name buildings as Pennsylvania. I know. So at this point, I suppose I should... And, uh, what have we here? Is that a lobster? A possum? Is it the same thing as back there? I really can't tell what the hell that is. Whatever it is, put it down, Jimmy. It'll give you rabies. Where was I? Ah, oh, that's great. The old rustic era. Note the original tile roof and the grapevines. <laughs> Noted. I noticed the veranda. I notice every veranda. I never forget to read a man his veranda rights. Whoa, that is a cool light. Hello, anyone home? Just going to stroll through the living room. Haha, <laughs> this isn't a contrived scene or anything. Aha! You see, I'm not the only one who uses a magnifying glass when I read. Take that, Jaden! And look here! Our old friends. In every fireplace. An old friend. Wonder what they're there for. But they're not there to burn logs because these logs aren't burnt. Aha! There you see. That's how the furnaces really bring heat. Well done. And, uh, it's a little weird running around someone's house like this, but we're searching for something. I don't know what. 1829? Uh, it's kind of a museum anyway. Obviously, it's not 1829 here. The old Washington Hotel, eh? Jibbadai, get off that damn horse. Quit trying to sell this to some sort of western. This is simply California. Ooh. And, yep, don't nothing to say here. Just rustic. Hey, old California, just what you'd expect from a bunch of pioneers out there making their lopsided last buildings by the brick and mud and all that. Hmm, this one's a bit more fortified than usual. Get a little closer to the city and we'll see. Uh, peek in the door here a little bit. Uh. All right, we're in. Send the rest. It's, the coast is clear. Nothing but a bunch of antlers on the roof, huh? Couldn't think of anything else to do with them. I just made a roof, roof of antlers. Okay. Seems like some wanton destruction to me, but I mean, what do I know? Not much of anything. These trees done raise the roof straight out the roof. You know what I'm saying? Huh? <laughs> I, lo I love it. I love the dedication to, uh, to the job. Well, it says here, damn it, Roosevelt, strike that. Give me the line again. Woodford. It says here, I need to photograph every fireplace. Well, probably not that one. It's full of rubbish. But it says every. All right, do it then. I'll get a couple angles just in case. Oh, uh, ran out of film. Yes, yeah, sir. But I do remember what it looked like, so I just, I just drew, I drew it up here. Uh, I hope I still get credit for the assignment. These are not unfinished. That's how they looked. I swear to Jabus. All right, and can you explain to me what's going on here? Oh, certainly. Well, out here, uh, see, these, these boys are having a race. And, uh, well... Down here, there's these tiny little mans or chickens or whatever. And this is their babysitter. Then along come this big old boy here. And he was strutting. You'd have thought his ass was Travis Tritt the way he came rolling into town. But these other boys over here, see, they ain't having that. That's a unicorn with his horns broken. No water buffalo here. He's plumb tuckered out. That's his girl, Nessie. Did I uh, miss anything? I meant the buildings, you jackass. Oh, the buildings. Right, right, right. That there's a building. <laughs> so, uh, when do I get paid for this? That night. The outlaws had a meeting. I don't know, guys. Something's not right. You said that last time, Bendejo, and nothing happened. We don't totally go for nothing. Yes, but every time is not like last time, Pedro. You guys. Hey. Hey, you guys. Cállate, puto. The men are talking. Okay, I, I only wanted to tell you. Cállate, puto. Okay, it's fine. But Jimmy turned into a vulture. Ah! Junior, what the hell are you doing out there? Mind your own business, pa. Getting to know the beasts. You a nasty boy. That's when Mrs. Petticoat, armed with a massive bazooka, returned to the base. You give me back my cows! And... Here it is. Eh? What do you think? What do I think of what? The campsite. Looks like shit. What happened here? Oh no, you made him sad. Magnifico! Before I go making fun of everything, I suppose I should tell you what it is first. This is the ruins of the mission Nuestra Senora de la Soledad. Founded in 500 October 9th, 1791 by Father Lawson, and the first permanent church began in 1808. Smallest and probably the least prosperous of all the missions. It became refuge for Monterey and Carmel Mission when the pirate Bouchard came to Monterey. And they united with San Antonio under secularization decree of 1834, and then they abandoned it in 1835. Restoration began over 120 years later. It's just a simple adobe construction. Accessory buildings are very modest, of course, as you can see. The tower roof is, or was, supported by hewn beams on peeled limb rafters and willow bow sheathing. Some of the roof tile was pilfered and taken to Rancho Alisal, near Salina, and used on Governor Alvarado's adobe. Adobe confused by what that means. These pictures were taken in 1962. And such glorious pictures they are. 
United and abandoned within a year. And you thought that would slip that one best, huh? You thought you'd just slip a drawing in there and I wouldn't notice, huh? This looks like a camel. Wait, that's not narrow. Try again. This looks like a camel. And yeah, I don't know. Do you believe that or not? I mean, sure, I guess. I don't see any reason to believe otherwise. Oh my god. Wow, horse here. And, uh, oh, there's a little bit of a ground discrepancy. Okay. Now we're heating up. Ma, told you the roof fell. Ma, can we get a new roof over here or what? How am I supposed to get a girlfriend? Talk about your fix your rapa. And I feel like these ruins appear to be much older than they claim. I mean, what would make them erode like this? Water? Like lots of rain, I suppose? Pay attention now here to these wooden beams, if you will. These cross beams. It's important because there are many times we see things such as this, where old posts were, and they rotted out. And you see the same thing sometimes over these doorways. That'll be important later, so just squirrel that away. Remember this conversation forever. Oh, why is this little guy upset? Act normal, Jim. Act normal. Yes, yes, yes. And here's where you'll be sleeping. Let me give you a tour. Let me give you a tour. Here's the family room. Uh, here's the living room. Here's the rooftop bar. Here's where you'll be sleeping. And out here is the bathroom. Any questions? Oh, that. That is the West Wing. Which you are never to enter under any circumstances. Are we clear? Painstakingly, sir. Come along, you folks. The tour's over. Back this way. No oh, shucks. I was hoping we'd find some gold bars. You think they'll make me return my beekeeper's veil? Whoa! Hmm. Okay, Jim, I'm going to the Water Wheel Festival, okay? Which one? Wait, which looked wait, Which one? This one? Or this one? Like, do I make it? Clean it up. What do you think? Kind of like it covered in vines. It looks more mysterious. This here is Dr. Edward Turner Bale's grist mill. Bale, like Bale of Hay. Built in 1840 by Irvin Kellogg, Dr. Bale, the English surgeon, arrived in Monterey in 1837, became surgeon for the California military under General Mariano Vallejo, became a naturalized Mexican in 1841, and married Maria Ignacio Soberanes, the niece of General Vallejo, granted Rancho Carne Humana, four leagues, 1841. Widow of W.W. W. Lyman, owner for many years, gave the grist mill who, to the doctor, who restored it under leadership of President Bismarck Brooch, a grandson of Dr. Bale, something like that. I don't know. It's all, the handwriting's all choppy. Look, all you need to know, okay, is that it was a three-star wood frame and timber building with a false front cap with bracketed cornices, okay? Any questions? Moving on. Come on now. We're staying here. Yeah, we're staying here with Uncle Larry till you guys free him from prison. Bad idea, kids, but suit yourself. It's not a prison, and that's not Uncle Larry, and he's not there involuntary. But, I mean, you know, if that's what they want to do with their lives, you know, who am I to get fringe, you know? Child freedom now, how about that? And that, folks, is my terrible idea of the day. Hmm. That there's a bridge. Yep, goes right over the mighty Yuba River. They claim it was built in 1861. <laughs> I got no reason to doubt that information, so there it is. Ah, it feels good to be back in civilization where the homes are nice and everything looks, uh, you know, it's been taken care of and again. For a second, I thought it was starting to feel like we were in Pennsylvania. And I was to be like, no, not all over again. But then I noticed that there actually were windows. Like, wow, okay, yeah, we're definitely not in Pennsylvania. And is this a line for the soup kitchen, or, uh... Yes, and keep your distance. Three feet at least, please. You can get close to me if you want, princess. No, thank you, sir. And what a hell of a house. And what a hell of a mystery. And uh, what a grand entrance. I mean, really quite preposterous, actually. And so the tour marches on to the break of dawn. Schreiber's beer. It's hard to describe it. You know you had a Schreiber's beer and you start talking like this. <laughs> now this town looks a bit funny. Equal parts rustic, equal parts what we've come to expect from the old empire. The fancy brickwork, the arched doorways and windows. Yes, yes. And it's a parking garage. The parking garage itself looked just a surprise. <gasps> what? These don't really look like they belong with the rest of them other buildings. Wonder what kind of backstory they done conjured up for them. Well, it don't offer much in the form of data. Put it that way. Mid-century wooden frame houses. With nothing to see here, folks. Okay? And that is literally all the information we're given. Just some old brick buildings. A little Methodist uh, Episcopal church there on the end there. Somewhere around here, there's a Masonic Hall and Wells Fargo building that uh, has no pictures. As we're making our way down the streets of Nevada County, North San Juan. Far too modern for my tastes. I'm giving you the bird and I'm walking away. Thank you. Ah, here we are. They claim this old place was a stone church and part of the San Juan mission, built around 1796. And that's it. They don't say anything else about it. Now, why, you wonder? 
And then meanwhile, we have these other houses with a wax poetically for 20 pages. I wonder why. Probably because they're not involved with these. So the ones that they're involved with themselves, they really want to paint a good story. I mean, this is a fantastic structure that I just have that written about it. I mean, look at the interior here. Madness. That looks like something out of Malaysia. Of course, there would be white doves in this fountain. And not looking very, uh, cowboy. The little Taco Bell facade here. Here as well. Can't tell if it's on the, like an old sarfort or something. Ooh, I'm telling mom, Jason hung porn on his wall. Here you go, the old rundown area of Auburn. And we're kind of strolling through these kind of quick because there really isn't much about them. Other than, you know, for example, this one is the Henry Stone House. Not that one. This one, Henry Stone House. Old Town, that's all it says. So much for our data page. And uh, the layered levels of this town do beg the question uh, whether or not this place was struck by perhaps one of our familiar little dirt rivers. Wink, wink. Something happened here. Look at these. Will these statues get torn off them or something? And what's this guy grinning about? And here in the outskirts of town, we come across something a little more what we're hunting for. And the supplemental data note card says, ready? Methodist Episcopal Church is the title. In the description, brick. That's right. Just brick. Just one word. The word brick. And apparently everyone's okay with that. And uh, yeah, place probably is pretty cute in person. Uh, parts of it. Uh, looking a little uh, sketchy. Look at all my scarecrow to flash people. Ah, Yen Chong, you have a question about me market, huh? F okay, first rule, me market. Don't talk me market. Don't come back until you have money. Excuse me, miss. You guys open? I sure do love the parlors here. A shrine to a good old George here. Probably a figment of all of our imaginations. Dotson. Dotson. We've got a Dotson here. Nobody cares. This is the old ancient cafeteria chair right next to the old ancient pac-man machine where i set the record score one time of course it resets every night so i couldn't prove it but me and her know don't we girl yeah we do we do kind of place you go inside and you order a malt with two straws for your girl and you slap a nickel down on the bar you know what i mean you guys remember that time when uh the time before i was born remember that one i don't you know when we talk about the history of america it's a little bit interesting to think about how we came to the ideas that we did. From what I gather, whenever we were trying to piece together the history of a region, it seems like some of the first things that you do are you explore, you gather artifacts, you study the land, and you study the artifacts, and you begin piecing things together that way. The ruins and things like that. But that's not what we did in America. It seems like we came here, destroyed all the artifacts, built some new ones. And when I say we, I mean like modern man. And uh, star theater, huh? How about that? Then someone wrote it down, and we just uh, repeated it, and kept repeating it, and suddenly it became, I mean, it seems like our history was just written, it wasn't like actually studied from, it wasn't derived from the study of the artifacts. The thing is, we really didn't need to study artifacts, because, you know, there were people living here, have been living here. Do we ask them? Is our history based on what they said? No, it's actually contrary to what they said, in a lot of ways. So really, how can we... How can we say with such certainty that this history is what they claim? Now, I know sometimes I get lost in the, you know, my mind wanders and I start making jokes about stuff, and that's kind of just my nature. At the heart of this research, really, the heart of this is to be lighthearted, is to return to a time when we were not such anxious creatures, stressing ourselves to death, quite literally. There's these unforgettable moments that can happen in your life that will be so touching and so vibrant and so inspiring that they seem to be larger than the whole of life itself. These moments that sort of stay with you forever, and they're part of you. They're embedded there just below the surface, like a landmine. And then there's lying in wait for the right song, or the exact smell, or the perfect setting, or this, whatever, this little trigger of a hint of familiarity. Maybe it's someone's expression. Maybe it's something someone said. Maybe it's a particular food. And once that little seed gets cracked, it triggers that memory, that moment got rushing over you. And it's invigorating and it's sorrowful. The, the lump in your throat is the knowing that though the memory exists now and here, the moment is, is gone forever. And as long as you might live, still one day that even the memory will die too. And there will be other moments that many other people will have, some of them just as magical, but it won't be that one. And in your heart, it's sort of known. It's, you've always known it. Some part of you knew it even as it was happening. So and so eventually, you know, it, it, you come to understand that gleam in your grandfather's eye when he's sitting there rocking in his chair, you know, world weary. He, he remembers, just as you will, you're, you're bright-eyed hungry. He remembers the hopeless sensation of having too little time which to see and taste and touch and read and know all that you want to. There's too much space between all these places to swim and run and ride. And there's too, too few nights to whine and dance and rage. And there's too few mornings till, you know, Lounge in the sun, smile dreamy, and knowing nothing will compel you to refrain from returning to your slumber. Too many things in the way. 
And now he knows, even now, this elder, this straw man elder, he knows it's never enough. How could it ever be enough? The world is infinite reinvention, and we have a shelf life, inescapable. And we, we, we watch animals sometimes, we take heart at their ability to seeming like never really mourn their loss for too long. They don't, they don't seem to mind being too young. And then they don't seem to mind being not young enough. And then they don't seem to mind being too old. And then there are those that would wish us harm. If I had to choose a flaw or a feature in humans that was something that we had been, something that could capitalize, could take advantage of, and utilize us to great extent to wish us harm, I, I'm kind of making a, com a compelling argument, I believe. To our trusting nature is kind of what this is about. We are often misled, misguided, manipulated. And I mean, even this country right now, the climate as it stands currently, at least from my own perspective, is nearly unrecognizable to what existed even a few short years ago. The world has completely devolved and our so-called leaders, elected leaders and representatives are for the most part, a criminal organization. They actively work towards the dismantling of every strength that we once had. Every value, every stroke of individualism, every spark of hope, sap our unity, our camaraderie, our, our comfort, they trample our traditions, our wealth, our family values, our liberties, our rights. Anything that unites us, they, they destroy it. And sometimes even our ability to provide for and defend ourselves. And half the population is, you know, using these mental gymnastics that are required in order to still defend their actions in defiance of all reality and logic, clinging to this lie desperately that at some level, some hidden secret sector, it's unidentifiable and improvement, but somewhere in the apparatus there exists a layer of these governments that are benevolent and good and working for the benefit of man. And some people never let go of that lie, even after the lights have gone out and the circus has left town. These distracted masses wound up until they're just powder kegs of anger, lashing out at everyone or lashing out at whoever the fraudulent showmen on their screens have decided to deflect onto. And It's tragic. I pity them, but I don't blame them. Not, I, I, I don't want, I refuse to be led astray by that, that question that constantly squawked about, like, who's they? Who's they? If you're asking who are they and claiming they can't be all in on it, here's your sign. The they is, for the most part, you. And no, you aren't all in on it. Very few of you are. You don't have to be in on it. You don't have to be in on it to support it. You don't have to be in on it to enact it or persecute anyone who dares to question it, do you? Like, you're a living testament to that. You are whom we learned who that they were from. The snakes in Hollywood, the snakes in the Vatican, the houses of government, they despise you. And even they aren't even all in on it. The lie, at this point, the lie is its own monster. It's propped up by its its own supporters. And you find this sort of relationship all over in the earth. It's called parasitism. So yeah, we got a parasite. Who are they? I'm not, I'm not, the, the answer to that question doesn't really intrigue me. I know that I know I know their intent. That's enough for me. My curiosity is aimed at establishing the veracity of the question is it's itself. It's when you rule out the impossible, whatever's left, no matter how ludicrous, you have to seriously consider it to be true. Because so much of what we are told about ourselves is impossible. That's that's what I'm pursuing. I don't aim to prove anything or convince anyone of anything. I want to present information. I want to shine a light that you may have never seen before. I want people to think about the world they're in and compare that to the world that they're told they're in. I'm not an archaeologist, historian by hobby, maybe. I'm not an architect, anthropologist. I'm just a curious person, determined, uh, with an inquisitive mind. And, and I think most importantly, I'm not afraid to consider ideas that people find absurd. In what can appear to be ridiculous, often I have found wisdom. And it's sort of become a mantra. So as I look at the natural physical world myself or anyone else, we don't need paper, credentials to use reason or logic. We, we, don't, we don't need permission to propose ideas based on things we see. We don't need to be a member of any club to examine the old manuscripts and maps. And, you know, your abilities to reason and logic are a gift, and I don't seek an end. I seek a beginning. Asking of myself who we are, where we're headed, why, is it, is it worth it? Are we going the wrong way? What for? Who's helping us? Who's hindering us? And a lot of people don't even examine their own beliefs. They just trustingly delegate this to professionals in various fields, perform for money, and they're propped up as having better methods and capabilities. Why wouldn't we just rely on them? Well, what if their expertise is based on false premise? What if it relies upon the assumed expertise of their instructors? And that's a false premise. What if the fundamentals of their field of study are deceptions? And accepting this as a possibility is a starting point towards systematically ridding your mind of and questioning the possibility that Major illusions shape the backbone and foundation of everything we are told about ourselves. This world, this history, this if it's all based on sound principles, then there's nothing to fear, right? Kick the old tires every now and then. So why are they afraid of any questions or ideas or experiments that flies in the face of the narrative? If it's so wrong, let it, let it, t let it stand on its own. Truth can be a lonely road, but it inevitably wins out. How to forget or how to unsee, and would you if you could? Maybe this is what we're called to do. Maybe this is why our enemy silences and censors our voice. I believe that we are the gardeners 
protectors and tenders of the earth and its creatures. We have our own quiet weapons. We can wage our own quiet resistance. Quiet at first, anyway. The old silent weapons, you know, for quiet wars. Not shooting bullets, but shooting seeds of idea, like bits of information. We used to fill these tea bags with seeds and soil and lob them into these abandoned lots and call it a uh, guerrilla gardening. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know you know that most of those seeds would fail but you hope that maybe just a few would take root and that, that's the hope that i still cling to it's a dying hope in a dying world surrounded by half-dead countrymen hope that a seed can just sort of take root and hope that one day one can find someone anyone willing to choose courage and look through different eyes with the strength to shatter the ground they stand on with the the fortitude to flip on the house lights and, and show your skeletons to expose your own belief system and your heroes and your culture and your history and to see if it's sound find the meaning on the off chance it's been denied you not everything not every truth we won't know every truth but some truth some semblance of the framework a little light sweeping around in, in a dark room trying to piece together what kind of room it is and how best to escape it we each, each got our own little beam of light but it's growing i don't ask anyone to take me on faith, I just want to encourage everyone to join in the hunt. I want to make observations, pontificate on some possibilities, speculate wildly, restructure maybe our methods for use for determining what's true, give you some stuff to mull over as you go about your life. So don't trust me. Trust that no one has the answers. I don't. Just trust that there are always those who want control. And those people who want control do one thing more than any other to obtain that control. The lie. It's the lure on the fishing line. It's the bait in the trap. It's the keys left in the car. It's the trick. It's the illusion. And this lie is the object of my fascination. The extent of it, the depth of it, and the truth it conceals, that's, that's the focus. This fight is for humanity. If the truth shall set us free, then the inverse must also be true. That the lie will keep us in chains. Like Prince said, tried to warn people. Control of your mind is the goal, and your soul is the prize. As long as we're under this withering attack from all angles, we don't have the ability or the skills to advance, blossom into our full potential. And it's because we know that they lie that everything is on the table. Including, but not limited to, the historic American Building Survey. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great production. Thank you all. I'll see you. I'll see you soon. Stop it, Jimmy. Do it right. Zoom, <laughs> zoom.